And tonight I want to um, I want to share on a, an idea that's been rattling around in me. It, it probably won't be new to you. So I hope it just builds you up and encourages you and helps you to maybe draw together two things that sometimes in the church are held as a bit of a tension, at least sometimes when I've seen it. Um, so I'm going to pray and then I'm going to share my screen and um, just walk you through just an idea. And um, I believe that I, I really feel like that um, God has asked me to talk about this tonight. So that means there's somebody here uh, that this is for. And so I'm going to try and walk through a little bit quieter than I normally do. Um, not get all bouncing off the walls and sort of knock you about the side of the head. Um, settle down, Ruben. You'll be okay. Um, <laughs> and um, because I, I, I think there's... There's some tension for people around some of this stuff and it doesn't have to be. Um, so I'm going to talk you through just the principle and then I'm going to give you a story about the idea. And amazingly, uh, Papa Luke, it fits in 100% uh, with what you were saying about kingdom come. Um, and so, and, it, and, I, and I know that it fits the culture of, the, of this family here. So um, I hope it blesses you. So let's pray. Dad, we know that you have words that are designed for our heart. You set us up for your preferred future for us. Uh, you believe in us more than we believe in us. You uh, have a um, affection for us that propels us into a belief about who we are and what we're here for. So we want to step into that more. We want to have soft hearts to that. We want to have open hearts to that. So teach us where we need to, to have your truth, um, not because it's right or wrong, because your words have life. And we want to live that life in Jesus' name. Amen. So I'm just going to pop my screen up, um, just a bit of a slideshow um, for tonight. And, um, and I'll just chat through some of this stuff. I'll see if I can get the right screen to appear. Oh, look at that. I think I've managed to get the right screen on. That's unusual. Uh, some of you will notice that there are two Bruce's on your uh, on your participants list. That's because I've got another little gadget that I use to try and help me determine whether I've got uh, the right slides up. Tonight it's uh, do your part, um, and and you can see in the the picture there's um, there's a sense where you fit into. You're part of the jigsaw puzzle. You're part of God's plan. You're even part of your his plan for you and to you. And there's a part that you get to play in this. And tonight I want to explore um, what, it mean, what it might mean for each of us to just understand just a bit more of what it might mean for us to do, do your part, to do the part that we have in, in terms of God's kingdom perspective uh, his family business perspective. One of the um, challenges that we have in this is that there's often, uh, at least in one area, two extreme ideas or two principles that seem to work against each other. Um, I've run across many believers, um, and, and the majority of believers that I meet have a mindset that accepts that um, God has, by grace, saved us. And, um, but some of the believers that I meet who believe that uh, miss the um, truth that there's a because of that belief, God shifts us um, and gives us a new reality that through this grace, he makes us a new creation. And we all know that the scriptures tell us that. So in Christ Jesus, I'm a new creation. And some believers don't know that. And so even though they accept they're saved by grace, um, some keep. Um, trying to get somewhere when the reality is God has already got them to that position and they can live from that somewhere. Now, on the other hand, there are believers who believe the same thing, that um, they have a mindset in their Christian life. They accept that God has saved us by grace, but they assume that being a new creation makes us complete in all ways. So some don't recognize that they are one and some assume that they are now complete because because the Bible says you're a new creation. They assume that that means everything is done 
and and what I mean by that, I, it doesn't mean that uh, God hasn't done all the work. What I mean is that there is nothing for them to do. It's complete. There's there's nothing in uh, left to do, and and I think for them, like the others, miss the idea that because they're trying to get somewhere and God has already got them there. This particular group have another another issue. They miss their own personal transformation and they miss the invitation of God to come into an agreement with his truths. And I want to suggest to you that the truth is somewhere else. It's, I'm not saying that either these two ideas uh, are not, don't have some truth, but I want to suggest to you that there's um, a different way to see it rather than seeing it as two opposing extremes. Uh, I want to suggest to you that maybe there's, a pathway or maybe one builds on the other so firstly what has God done and we we know that in Christ Jesus God is like we've we've spent the last year here just just wonderfully enjoying uh, the power of the cross and what he has done uh, way back in history what he's gathered up in Adam the promises of Abraham uh, how he untangled us from the law how he's uh, not only done all that, the atonement and sacrifices and all the things that he's, uh, the righteous requirements of the law are fully met. All of these amazing things that are done that deal with history. But we also understand that he set us up for a totally new covenant and a new future um, and repositioned us into intimacy with the Father. So there's this amazing work of grace that what God has done. And, and maybe we could spend the rest of our lives and still not fully even cognitively understand it, matter, get a hard affection for it. But I want to suggest to you that what God has done uh, has changed our situation to change what we do with it. And so that instead of having two diametrically opposed um, ideas that um, sometimes we're working to get the grace and the grace is already done. And the other thing is that you already are fully everything. And well, yes, you have opportunity to be everything and that's promised. But um, there's a part that you get to play in this. What do you do with it? So uh, it's sort of it's sort of like what's on the other side of the cross. Now, I, I meet many Christians, and, and I've been one of these for years, that I've spent most of my time uh, on the other side of the cross. And, I, and, and even as a believer, I'd still be coming to the cross saying, I need the cross, and I, need, and I already had all the benefits. I just didn't realise I had all the benefits. Nobody told me I had all the benefits, and I'd been trained in an environment where you keep coming to the cross and... and um, be, but that has been done. And when Jesus said it was finished, maybe it was finished then. Maybe even now it's still finished. And maybe what it needed to do for me is finished. And now I need to do something with it. So I want to suggest to you that instead of seeing these two things as opposing each other, that maybe there's one building on the other. So that God gives us grace to reposition us so that we can partner with that and do the next thing. Um, and I'm going to I'm going to sort of back that up a bit with a few scriptures just and I'm sure many of you are convinced by this already. But I know that there are some people that have been taught that when it says you're a new creation, everything's finished. Uh, and and sometimes the, the easiest way to um, recognize for them that it's not complete is just to look at their lives because their lives are not an exact imitation of the character and qualities of Jesus. And that's not a condemnation. It's just an observation. So one of the passages I, I like, and I think it deserves a little attention, is from Philippians 2, and it's um, second half of verse 12 and, and a bit of 13. And it says, Work out your salvation with fear and trembling, for it is God who is at work in you, both to will and to work for his good pleasure. So it's very important to understand that there's grace in there for it is God who is at work in you, not because you deserve it, because he, he wills it and because it's his pleasure for God so loved the world that he gave his only son, not God wanted to kill the world. So he gave his only son, not God wanted to kill his son. So he gave his only son. God so loved us. And then in the midst of that, Paul's understanding as he's journeying along this pathway of following Jesus and trying to see how the reality of that lands in his life. And he's a, He's a bit of a hero in the text for us. He's a guy that had a real crack at doing mission and he had a crack at reaching out to the world and he had a crack at intimacy with the father. So when he says, work out your salvation, he's not saying work for it. I believe he's saying you get the gift and now you get to work with it. 
And that's what you, that's how you do your part. Now, there's a reason why we need to do that. There's a reason why we need to work with it. Um, the Father's already done his part, which is, as we know, in the power of the cross, he's, he's repositioned, repostured us by a profound grace, which positions humanity back in a pathway for successful life. Now, that and that's successfully emotionally, spiritually, relationally. Um, it's successful in all areas that we had repositioned on that pathway we were repositioned at that starting point and for, for many of us there were many things to um to get sorted out in us because many of our ideas aren't positioned in idea and in principle and in behavior and learnt environment whether it's in church or in your family or just in society and so um, sometimes we're not actually walking out of the truth that god has and most of us know that and that doesn't mean we're not getting there more and more and more and more. But the truth is that we need to um, not work for this grace because the grace is freely given, but work with it and to, to work out the benefits of that salvation into my life. And there's the idea of work means I've got to do something. I've got to participate. I don't, I don't have to participate to get grace. I've got to participate with grace. Um, I'm going to be agreeing with who I truly am. And the reality for many of us is that, and, and that's why I've done some work wrestling with that idea of our identity as sons and daughters and how that is seen in the scriptures and what the benefits are. And we'll talk a little bit about that application around the Lord's Prayer. And as we were reminded in um, Papa Luke's sharing earlier. And so part of this, I am a new creation. And now I, know, now I want to work out the reality of the benefits of all that. Um, and I'm going to do some work in myself. And, and Papa Luke has a toolbox um, that really helps people to be able to do that. Uh, Ruben has some um, skills and resources that he can give to people to help them work out how to be successful. And so does Matthew in terms of bona fide believers. But agreeing with who I truly am creates a new foundation to set me up for that success. But I need to untangle myself from some of the lies that I might have experienced from the world around me, from my family, even in my church. Now, some people say, no, no, if you're a new creation, you're a new creation. That's it. It's settled. It's all done. Now, God's work on it's all done. But maybe I have a little bit of soul um, untangling to do. And, and the reason I suggest that to you is that I don't think God has um, waved a magic wand over your head over your soul certainly has given you a new spirit and you have a new spirit fully aligned with god in um, your old sin nature's gone you have a new spirit um, you most of us didn't get a new body when we got saved and you know we have new authority over it but we got our souls saved and our heart and mind is in a journey of coming into agreement with those other truths and i think god calls us into uh, on the other side of the cross on the other side of grace i think god calls us to be uh, willing partners, willing agreeers. I think he calls us um, in terms of the kingdom to be co-laborers. We labor with him, with his will and in with his purpose. And I think we're co-missioned. So as Christ was uh, commissioned in ministry, and we know that from Luke 4, he sort of goes, tag your writ, and he wants us to be co-missioned, partners in that mission. And as we go on that um, journey, we know from the scriptures that it's, it's like if you're a new creation and you just got there and it's all done, then why would he ask you to be transformed by the renewing of your mind? Why would we need to take responsibility for looking at our heart life, our soul life, um, and doing some uh, renovation and restoration work on that and getting it to come into alignment? Why would we need, as the scriptures say, to renew the spirit of our mind? Why would we need to set our hearts and minds on things above? If they were a new creation, they'd already be there. Why would we need to um, use our divine capacity to demolish any strongholds that set themselves up? And, of course, we know those strongholds are heart agreements that are with lies. Why would we need to go from glory to glory if we were already the fullness of the new creation? I'm not saying it's not already purchased and paid for. I'm 100% in agreement with that. 
But what I'm saying is that we need to come into that. Why would we need to equip the saints that they could grow up to the full maturity and statue of Christ if we're already at our fullness and the full statue of who we're meant to be? Why would we need to move from uh, mature from milk to meat if we were if that new creation um, truth was already fully present in us, even though it's fully accessible to us? Why would even in that understanding, and for them, some of you have looked at some of the stuff I've chatted about, moving from Technon to Huios, moving from little children around the father's feet to um, sons and daughters in the family business training to see kingdom come. Why would we need to do that? Just, uh, it's, it's, it's asking, it's not asking us to abandon the idea that we're a new creation. It's asking us to come into an agreement to work and to do your part to come into the fullness of that truth. So, and here's another passage I really like, and it's from Philippians as well, um, Philippians 3.10. And this sets the stage for the part that I want to mention, that I may know him. This is Paul's main desire, and it is that I may know him. And so it's the know of intimacy. It's not the know of knowledge. Uh, that I may know him and the power, the dunimas of his resurrection, the what happened on the other side of the cross, the same spirit that raised him from the dead raises me to new life. So I may know the power of the resurrection and the fellowship of his sufferings and being conformed to his death. So in other words, that I might die to my old sin nature and rise in him in order that I may attain to the resurrection from the dead. And he counts everything as nothing compared to knowing that. And then he says this, and this is again coming in to ask that question, is God building upon the grace and getting you to do your part or are you already there? And Paul makes this statement, and I love it, and I think it makes sense to me, but it'll certainly sound contradictory for those who say you are already a new creation, as in it's already happened. I know it's happened in the spiritual realm, but you need your soul to agree with that spiritual realm. Paul says here, not that I have already obtained it. Hang on a minute. Well, it's already given by grace. No, not that I've already attained it. I've already become perfect. Hang on. So I'm not, I'm not the full new creation. But he says, but... I press on. In other words, he's working with it. He's not working for it. He's working with it. I press on so that I may lay hold of that for which also I was laid hold of by Christ. So some of you are watching the screen, you can see my hands. And, and it's like we reaching into a relationship with Christ and he grabs hold of our arm and we grab hold of his arm and, and he lays hold of us and we lay hold of him and we do that. To, to obtain the very thing that he's done all this ministry for. So I press on that I may get a hold of that which Christ laid hold of me for. And then he says, I do not regard myself as having laid hold of it yet, not fully. But the one thing I do, forgetting what lies behind and reaching forward to what lies ahead. And this is that journey of standing on top of the grace and doing my part. I press forward to the goal for the prize, the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. And I like that. I, I love the idea of laying hold of that which Christ laid hold of me for. I, I, I find that precious. I see that as deeply connected. I see that as nearly like a form of rescue. I don't see it as... Um, Having to work for something, I see working with it. I see growing on something, not trying to get something. Let me put it in the context of the, the Lord's Prayer, and, and there's a bit of a story around this in terms of, of the past for me. Um, the Lord's Prayer, and many of you have heard me share about this, and, and it became a, a pivotal point when I started to talk about sonship, and I'd mentioned sonship in um, ministry context here for a month or so and then God brought it back to me 18 months later or thereabouts and, and I said look I've already done this and he said no you haven't and and I said well look I don't know what to say so you're gonna have to give me what to say and he took me to the Lord's Prayer and I sort of looked at it and I come from a tradition where the Lord's Prayer is used pretty um, consistently but ne not necessarily with the heart and the intention of its design so it's used ritualistically it's, it's used in the prayer book it could be used the right way but sometimes we just use it like a full stop or like I've, I've ticked the box so therefore you know you need to do what you need to do because I've done the right thing in other words I worked for it 
And he showed me um, an image of the time when the Lord's Prayer was taught and the disciples said, teach me how to pray. And he said, pray this way. And we, we all know the verse. But then he showed me a, like a, a movie in my mind, like a vision in my mind of the disciples standing with Jesus. And he showed me their heart and they're, they're looking at Jesus and they're saying, like, when you, when you pray, heaven moves. Uh, and we know they're amazed and terrified and many other, you know, descriptive words like that where it talks about the disciples watching kingdom come. And then they say to him, we want, we want to pray like you. Like a disciple is chosen because the, the master believes the disciple can do what the teacher does. So the, the teacher chooses the disciple because he believes in them, not the other way around. And Jesus chose them. And they're going, look, when we pray, it's kind of a bit clunky and it doesn't quite work like you do. So teach us how to pray like you because that was the rabbinical model. And it's an amazing model. And Jesus teaches them something extraordinary. And I, I see him put his arm around the shoulder of one of the disciples and, and pull him into him and, and look at him whilst he's having all the others watch. And he looks at this disciple and he says, I want, I want you to call my dad your dad. When you pray, I don't want you to talk to God Almighty sitting on a heavenly throne or um, some distant deity. I, I, I want you to talk to the God of heaven and earth like he's your dad and he uses that Abba idea and so he he pulls this disciple into a whole new posture and whole new relationship and um and then he says i, I want you to just honor his character I want, hallowed be his name is what we say but it's such a crazy statement there's not a lot of times in my life that i've ever said oh hallowed be that garden or hallowed be that you know, cake or sorry, Rebecca, your cakes are probably worth hallowing. Uh, hallowed be, um, you know, that paint job on the car or hallowed be whatever. We'd, it's not a word that we use a lot, but I, I, I see it as honoring the nature of your dad. And it's like a kid who has a great dad who, who's protect him. And, and you can nearly see these kids in the playgrounds having this debate about who's dad's best. And, oh, my dad can do this and my dad's great and my dad can do this. And, and that's when you've got a good dad and a good relationship. And you're bragging on your dad and that's what this is. So you know, I want you to talk to God Almighty, the creator of heaven and earth, which they didn't know him quite like this in the Old Testament, but certainly Jesus did. He said, I've come to, uh, I've done what you've asked me to do. I've made you known. And this is in John 17. And he said, I've made you known as my father but I've also made you known as their father. And then he, he's making him known by his character as well. If you know me, you know the father, you know he's trustworthy. So hallowed be your name is not, I don't just, saying that sort of like reading the heading of a book and not reading the book. Saying our father and not connecting with the relationships, like reading the um, heading of a book but not reading the book. No, I, like, it's like an introduction to somebody and not meeting them. And then you've got this moment where you pause and you just enjoy the very nature and character of who God is. And many times it's in his name. And we know that his name, and certainly in the Old Testament, um, El Shaddai, my supplier, Adonai, my master, Jehovah Jireh, my provider, uh, Jehovah Rapha, my healer, Jehovah Nissi, my banner. So many more. There's, hun there's a hundred or so. And they all talk about who you can trust him to be. But we get to, in, in the Old Testament, that's, they were his names. But in the New Testament, in the New Covenant, his name's Dad. And my dad is like this. He's, this is his character. And then we step into, thy will be done here on earth as it is in heaven. Now, I've written there, this is um, our assignment. Because we're the ones praying it. We're not, so if you're, if you're on the wrong side of the cross, you're still asking God to do what he's assigned you to do. If you're on the wrong side of the cross, and I don't mean if you don't understand how grace repositioned you and you get to stand on top of that, on that repositioning and start to mature so you become into the full stature of Christ and then you start to get to be the ambassador of kingdom come. If you don't understand that, you'll be on the other side of the cross still begging God to do something like a slave or a servant. Um, if you don't know that you're a new creation, but, but you're a work in progress of coming into agreement with that. And uh, the reason I raise this is because there was a, a situation in a, um, in a church some years ago, and we'd been, we'd been on the wrong side of the cross. We'd been standing there praying from that, oh, please, God, please, God, begging and, and uh, not, rec and, you know, 
we, we'd say we're a new creation, then we'd jump over to the other side of the cross again because we didn't know how to stand on it. Um, we kept asking God to take us to a place that he'd already positioned us in. We didn't know how to, we didn't know how to mature into it. And um, we'd been, I'd been learning, I had a bit of a breakthrough, a bit of a revelation around the Lord's Prayer, and it sort of messed with my head. And, it, and it, there's six different phrases, but I only talk about these three. And every time we'd pray, I'd, I'd walk people through, I'd teach. Um, some of you know I'd, I'd talk about the, um, the discipleship square. It's um, do what I do. So watch me, help me, I'll help you, and then you do it. But it's a little bit more to it, but Ruben could share some of it. Maybe we'll share another day on that. Um, and I was walking the, the church through what I'd learned. So I was showing them first. And when we'd pray for people, I'd started to realize that God had, God's kingdom come was a done deal and that I didn't have to beg for it. I had to stand as a son who knew my dad and knew what his character was like and, and, and pick the characteristic that suited the need of the situation and then speak to the situation from the intimacy of being with dad who was like this and then say kingdom's got to come because dad said so. And, I, and we would model this over and over again. And people say, oh, well, this is amazing. And then, then they'd just go back to their begging prayer or their servant's prayer or their trade-off prayer or a hundred different other prayers and stand on the wrong side of the cross. It's not a criticism. It's what they learned. It's just an observation. So even though they were a new creation, they didn't know how to walk it out. And that proves that we need to be transformed and we need to press on and lay hold of and, and we need to work out our salvation. So... One day we got to the time of prayer and then the community was really used to me by this stage, um, which takes a fair bit. And uh, anyway, this particular day, uh, we were asking people who wants prayer for healing, who wants, who wants prayer blessing. And someone put their hand up and I said, okay, do you mind coming out the front? And we, I come from a more traditional sort of background. So coming out the front was fairly Pentecostal. Um, and so, you know, the, I knew I knew had to know the person to be able to get away with that. They said yes. And then I said, who wants to pray for this person? And which was a slightly different tactic. So we do prayer groups and we'd have prayer meetings and other things and people would pray, but not at the main worship service. And, and so generally speaking, I'd work with a leader or a leader in training somebody that it was being equipped. And one of one of those people who was still very much a person that would beg and trade off and do that sort of on the wrong side of the cross prayer who loved God but hadn't understood that they could posture themselves in a different way, put, she, she, this lady put her hand up. And that was encouraged because she, she trusted me. And I said, will you, will you take you through um, the principles of the Lord's Prayer rather than the script? Because we were too used to the script. And, and, and she agreed. And so this day I said, I, I don't want you to focus on the problem. I don't want you to focus on um, Bob's back or whatever it was at the on the time i, I don't want you to because that's what we do oh please god oh the situation's so bad no oh, they're so nice and you should help them because we're nicer than you are um not to do all that funny uh, manipulative and and ridiculous sort of behavior and and i say i can say that now because we don't do it but back at the time there would have been times i would have done it so um, i'm just as um conditioned by my religious heritage as maybe anybody else was not now. And, and so I walked this lady through and I said, um, and, and I said to whoever the person was getting prayer, are you okay if we use this as a teaching illustration for the whole church? And that person was okay. And I said to the person praying, are you okay if we use this as a teaching opportunity for the whole church? And that person was okay. And they both trusted me, which was good. Anyway, so I just spent, and I said to the whole church, you get to watch and I don't want any commentary. You're allowed to go, wow, but other than that, that I don't want to hear anything. And so we, I just literally did the D1 to D4 and the L1 to L4, this sort of leader training another person to walk in the fullness of what this beautiful, intimate, connected prayer of principles, not script, was teaching us like Jesus had taught his followers when he said, I want you to get so impressed with heaven and who your dad is that you leak it on earth. So, so I spent some time with this lady and I just said, our father, Jesus is inviting us to call the heaven, God of heaven and earth, our dad. And um, she'd had a pretty reasonable relationship with her father. So getting her to lean into the idea of just letting dad hug her and, and letting dad 
be near her and, and welcome her and just to be more impressed with his presence than anything else wasn't too hard. And then I said, and how good is your dad? And so we had this chat back and forth. Is, is your dad like this? Is dad like this? And we went back and forth and back and forth and back and forth. And she's just getting caught up in that atmosphere, uh, which fits in with something Ruben was saying earlier, wasn't it? Anyway, and then we got to this moment of the, um, we want your kingdom to come here on earth. And we'd focused on um, dad being a healer. And we're really proud of him. We know if he's there, it's done. So he is there. So he's tagged us. He says, you're it. I give you authority. And then we, we said, bring your kingdom here now. We declare your kingdom must come now because you've, you've given us this prayer and you've made it our assignment. And you've made it our words. So your will be done here now like it is in heaven. And you don't have that sickness in heaven, which means that's not allowed to be here now. And at that moment, see, this lady was more impressed with the solution than she was with the problem. And at that moment, she felt, uh, um, she described it as a real uh, large or uh, impressive presence of Holy Spirit, just the power of God on her, resting on her and in her. And she felt power coming through her hands. And, uh, and, and, and the person felt it as well. And then I asked her, had she felt that before? Now, she'd been a lady who'd felt the presence of God before, but she'd never felt it so powerfully in a moment of prayer. And... and um, I'm convinced that if Jesus taught us to pray that way, there's some principles in it that a beginner could use that would be really precious. And that maybe we, if we feel like a beginner, we'd pray that way before we tried to pray any other way, because, um, you know, start where he gets you to start and then move on. If you think you're better than him, um, that's a bit of a tongue in cheek thing. Um, and so I, I call it something like lean back and then lean forward, lean back into the fullness and the presence of God Pick the character that you know God has because your dad's good. And let's say you need stuff and focus on how much of a provider he is. And just, you know, let the stories of history and other people and, you know, let those testimonies roll over you. Just know that dad is with you and he'll never leave you and he's for you. And it's not about your sin anymore. This is about his goodness. You don't have to earn it. You, you don't have to work for it. You work with it. Um, you've been given the gift of grace, which you grow on and upon. And then just let your heart be impressed with how much dad loves you and how much he, is, he trusts you and how much he's assigned you to be the kingdom ambassador. And so we, we found that really helpful. And we found it helpful in all sorts of situations to be solution focused, not problem focused, to recognize that we're in a partnership of kingdom come. It's family business and we're dad's kids and he wants us to be full-blown partners in the family business and grow up into the fullness of sharing it. And we, we can trust his person and his promises because he who is faithful, uh, uh, he who promises is faithful and all his promises are yes and amen in Jesus. And we are positioned to be stewards of the kingdom. And so I think we build upon grace and we work out our salvation by maybe untangling ourselves from some ideas that maybe weren't, we weren't designed for. Maybe taking on the word that has life and is medicine to our whole being and letting that form us. Maybe joining with people like Papa Luke and Reuben and, and whoever helps us to, to build upon something. And maybe pressing on. And it's okay because you're fully loved and you're fully positioned and you've, there's grace abundant for us. But still, like Paul, press on and lay hold of that which Christ laid hold of us for. And in that, we don't have to do the part of grace that's done, but we do our part in cooperating with it and standing upon it and maturing in it. And, and without any con condemnation, without any sense of performance and that we move to glory to glory and we move from areas where we need to grow from milk to meat and where we get out of being kids around dad's feet and we go up to kids that are partnering and running the family business because we have complete access to this beautiful, wonderful, loving father through our amazing and glorious and gracious brother and inspired and powered by beautiful Holy Spirit who, who's come to live in us and guide us into this. So I'm going to pray and we'll just uh, bring the little chat to a close for tonight, just to encourage you to do your part. Father, I want to thank you that um, 
yeah, you've done everything necessary and nothing that we do. We've got nothing to boast in, but we can stand upon what you have done, the grace that you've done, and grow fully into that new creation that we are in your eyes and that we're coming to agree into in our hearts uh, without any condemnation. And there's wonderful grace for us even in that journey. Father, help us to stand on the other side of the cross and know what it means to be walking in a new covenant, sons and daughters of God, co-heirs with Christ, learning to step up and step out and say glory to glory and become that, you know, Christ in us, the hope of glory for those who are yet to be saved. Become those who walk in the fullness of who you meant to be as a son and daughter so that um, the world that's groaning to see sons and daughters made manifest, that part of the world that we live in won't have to groan anymore. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.